Well, thank you for thank you for having me here. I'm really honored, and uh, I'm really glad it worked out. And um, uh, between my uh, consulting job, I do a lot of weekend board retreat facilitations and, and Dharma activities. Weekends can be a little hairy and complicated. So. Um, I have to say, my mom's going to be so thrilled that this is being taped. <laughs> so, um, I really love the topic today. The precepts. What is that? The Buddhist Ten Commandments. And, um, and before I uh, just share my thoughts with you and, uh, and my experience and what I've studied on the topic, I wondered if maybe a couple of you might um, just share how you would describe or define a commandment. I know you're not shy. <laughs> what well, commandment to me is, if you say command, it means something that you, you must do. And there's consequences if you don't do it. Yeah. It's like a guideline for living. So command consequences if you don't do it, guidelines for living. And somebody else is telling you. Somebody, somebody else is telling you. Mm -hmm. A little less from your own experience, more from mm -hmm. from the outside kind of. Great. Well I'm gonna uh, come back to your definitions in just a couple of minutes. Um I thought what I would do is give just a teeny bit of um very, very little bit of historical context for the precepts. I find it interesting, and I started teaching a Buddhism 101 class, and so I've re-fallen in love with the whole history of our practice. Um, and then um, kind of go over the precepts, and then, um, and then just share my thoughts about the topic. And, um, and I want to say overall that um, I think fundamentally the precepts are about living with compassion, about this commitment to um, alleviate rather than cause suffering with how, with our words, with our actions, um, and even with our thoughts. And so I think the precepts represent vow to do that. And, um, and actually, um, roadmap, a very practical set of um, practices for living in the way that we've committed to. And, um, and they actually, uh, the 16 bodhisattva precepts, and there are some different numbers of precepts depending on the school of Buddhism, but I'm trained and ordained in Zen, so that's what we get today. Um, they have their roots actually in the Sangha that grew around the Buddha after his enlightenment and when he started teaching. Um, more and more people um, became part of his community, wanted to learn from him, and um, they actually were wandering monks a good part of the year, and then during the rainy season, and this is how the three-month practice period started, um, they would gather and do intensive meditation um, and, uh, and receive his teachings. And then when the rainy season was over, they'd scatter. Um, and um, so, so the Buddha began developing guidelines, rules, if you want to call them rules, that were ultimately called the Vinaya, um, for harmonious living within the community, within the Sangha. And they actually um, grew kind of situationally. You know, when one monk called another monk a name um, or accused them of something, the Buddha would um, turn that conflict into a teaching and develop a guideline or a rule around that. And, uh, and the purpose was really to um, in a very practical way, enable the Sangha to live with the teachings with each other and deal with each other in an upright way. And, um, and the Vinaya rules were further developed actually after the Buddha died, which was in about 543 BCE. There were two councils. Um, you know, I keep thinking of some of these conferences we have as professionals with, um, you know, um, sponsors and uh, Ex exhibitors and that kind of thing, but I don't think these councils were like that. <laughs> um, uh, there was one immediately after the Buddha died, and there was one about 40 years after he died, and there were, 
another in the in the century after that. But the first two were really about well, how how are we going to function now that our leader has passed away, um, has you know reached nirvana, and so many more um, rules that were the vinaya were developed, and um, there were actually about 254 male monks bhikkhus. And no surprise, about 330 for women bhikkhus. Um, and uh, just a couple of examples for um, you know both women and male monastics, not to create disagreement between each other, not to change the conversation when the sangha asks a question. I'll try and remember that. <laughs> and then the uh, the bhikkhunis. Should any bhikkhuni agitate for a schism in a united community, or should she persist in taking up an issue conducive to schism? The bhikkhunis are to admonish her. Thus, do not, lady, agitate for a schism in a united community, or persist in taking up an issue conducive to schism. Let the lady be reconciled with the community, for a united community on courteous terms, without dispute, with a common reaction, dwells in peace. So a little pedantic in style. <laughs> um, but those particular rules that I've chosen to share kind of go toward harmonious living, um, you know, respecting one another, and also taking care of the lady of the community that, um, you know, in those days supported the monastics. So it probably was a good idea not to ignore their questions. Um, and, uh, and some of the, uh, the rules are really pretty strange to, to a modern person. And many of the rules for bhikkhunis have to do with sexuality and propriety and that kind of thing. And they really are um, you know, very reflective of the ancient times in which they were developed. Um, but ultimately, over the years, they became our precepts. And so I want to... Um, I want to just read the precepts to you and then break them down a little bit. Um, so there are actually three sort of sets of precepts within the overall 16, and I'm sure you're familiar with them. The first of the three refuges, really this choice to live in vow, to live in truth, to live with things as they are or as it is, as Suzuki Roshi taught, San Francisco Zen Center. Um, when it's wonderful and when it's painful, we turn towards our lives. We look to transform our suffering so we can help others. I take refuge in Buddha. I take refuge in Dharma. I take refuge in Sangha. And when you um, receive lay ordination, which is the blue bib that people wear, it's called a rakasu, um, you, you take these precepts, you vow. And when you're priest ordained, you do the same. Um, and it's a, making a deeper, more formal commitment to practice, to harmony. Um, the three pure precepts, I vow to do no ill. I vow to do all good. I vow to live for the benefit of all beings. Um, and then the ten clear mind precepts. I vow not to kill. I vow not to take what is not given. I vow not to misuse sexuality. I vow not to lie. I vow not to intoxicate the mind or body of self or others. I vow not to slander. I vow not to praise self at the expense of others. I vow not to be spiritually or materially avaricious. I vow not to harbor ill will. I vow not to disparage the three treasures. And the three treasures are the three refuges, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So those are the 16 bodhisattva precepts. And a bodhisattva is um, a being who makes a commitment to stay, stay with us, stay in this world, not to go to nirvana or on top of a mountain once reaching enlightenment to sit cross-legged for eternity, but to stay with us until we're all enlightened. 
Um, I think it's a heroic commitment because, you know, basically they're stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know, lucky them and lucky us because I wouldn't want to be anywhere but here personally speaking, especially with all of you. And um, so Buddha is teacher, Dharma is teaching, and Sangha is, as all of us, is community that supports each other in this vow to do good, to alleviate suffering rather than to cause it. And, um, and together we take refuge in, in our lives as they are, in this moment as it is. And, um, and I, when I first started practicing, kind of confused refuge with comfort. You know, I thought that refuge would be very comforting, you know, like when you curl up in a blanket with a cup of hot tea and watch five episodes of Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> we each have different comfort. With your cat on, with your, cat on your stomach, that's very important. Um, but the refuge are, refuges are not necessarily comfortable. Taking refuge isn't necessarily comfortable because sometimes life is so painful. But taking refuge in life as it is means together we turn towards whatever is true for us. And we support each other in doing that. We um, learn from our teachers and we um, learn from the teachings. And uh, this is a wonderful book about the precepts. It's called The Mind of Clover. It's by Robert Aiken Roshi, um, who uh, leads the um, Diamond Sangha in Hawaii. Now there's a place you want to go on, Sushin. <laughs> um, and it's just, a, I highly recommend it. He um, has both a poetic and a very p practical way of teaching about the precepts. Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha can be understood here to mean realization, truth, and harmony. Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha can be understood here to mean realization, truth, and harmony. So, so this vow of Sangha as harmony, and in my experience, both direct and observation, taking the precepts, developing a personal relationship with them, and practicing with them, helps to cultivate the harmony that Sangha can be. And when there's trouble in the Sangha, dealing with that trouble from the place of the precepts of vow, um, means that we can be upright and really face what is together and, uh, and address it. Um, the three pure precepts, vowing to do no ill, to do all good, to live for the benefit of all beings, is this, this big, broad vow. You know, I have to say, when I was ordained, I thought, oh my god, what am I getting with that? Because <laughs> it's, um, it's ambitious. It's, uh, for me, also inspirational. And um, I kind of feel like I'm so glad I do have Sangha because we can all um, figure out what this big, inspirational, ambitious vow means together and how in little ways, you know, the way you treat the checkout person at Trader Joe's, we can embody these vows. Um, and uh, the ten clear mind precepts vowing not to kill, not to take what is not given, not misusing sexuality, not lying, not intoxicating the mind or body of self or others, not slandering, not praising self at the expense of others, not being spiritually or material aver materially avaricious, not harboring ill will, not disparaging the three treasures. Um, for me, those are um, very, very practical ways of living our vows, of, of learning about our vows, of embodying our vows. Um, and I've developed both an appreciation and a love for them. And then, as, as I said, in the last couple of years, I've become so conscious of how they cultivate compassion. Uh, because I think it's really very difficult to practice with the precepts without your heart of compassion kind of opening up and eventually flowing over to be very real about what's in my heart, you know, the shadow side and uh, the side that's full of light. 
and to make a choice how to work with those parts of myself and how to support others in doing the same and making a choice with my consciousness about who I am to um, not embody the shadow side. And I'm here to tell you it doesn't go away in case you didn't know. <laughs> but we get to have a relationship with it. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about the precepts um, is that they're not hard and fast rules or commandments. Um, I think there are consequences um, if I don't live and practice the precepts. Um, it's not about being struck down by an angry God, but it's about, um, I love this term, the Ten Clear Mind Precepts, and when I, um, when I take someone's time and energy that they haven't given me, I vow not to take what is not given, I feel it, and my mind isn't clear, it's troubled, you know, it's, um, you know, it's like, uh, it can be like a, a body of water in a storm. And the same is true about lying. And uh, my specialty is um, praising self at the expense of others. I, um, I like attention. That's a big part of my shadow side. And so, um, so it's really important for me to know that. Because if I'm not aware of it, um, I'm going to cause harm. And so, each of us, our practice with the precepts, our relationship with the precepts is very personal and it's really individual. And as a community, we practice the precepts together. As I said, especially when issues come up. <clears throat> um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about a, a, a couple of these precepts that seem that could be related to in a very, forgive the phrase, straightforward way. Um, <laughs> but there's a lot of subtlety to them and a lot of kind of facets to the jewel that they are. And the first one I want to talk about is I vow not to kill, which seems kind of open and shut. You know, for some people it means being a vegetarian. You know, then there are many Buddhists, including myself, who not only practice but are ordained or have received Dharma transmission and eat meat. So what does that mean? I vow not to kill. And, um, and there are many ways of killing, of causing harm, that are um, not about literally taking physical life. Um, I can kill my own spirit by uh, being hard on myself. I can do the same with, with someone I'm involved with by how I deal with them. Um, I can kill joy. Um, so, so there's lots of ways of practicing with this precept of not to kill. To look at what my shadow side is, if I, um, the other thing I want to say about the precepts is, you know, when you look at one of them, you always end up looking at most, if not all of them. If I am um, praising self at the expense of others, if I'm taking up attention when it hasn't been freely given, um, there's a lot of different levels of harm that's actually caused. Um, uh, it means someone else isn't getting to do what they really want to do, which isn't listen to me. <laughs> and, um, and it means that people's energy is affected. And, um, and it certainly can create ill will on, on one level or another. So, um, so just the simple precept, I vow not to kill, has a lot of levels to it. And um, I think in terms of, of the Sangha as harmony, um, just for me to practice that precept as an illumination of my shadow side um, can cultivate harmony. I actually had... Um, a situation with a Dharma sister where she felt I was um, making a big deal out of myself and kind of overshadowing other people. And it's hard to believe. <laughs> and um, that was really hard to hear. This was a few years ago. But that's what I want from my sangha because in my experience it's very rare that people will hold a mirror up to you. The, the jewel mirror samadhi, hold that jewel mirror up and say, Lovingly, she was very compassionate in a firm kind of way. Um, this is what I'm experiencing. You might want to take a look at this. 
-hmm. and, um, and it made me see at another level the disharmony that my taking up space that hasn't been freely given can cause. And it may be that people don't really notice it other than me and my friend, although I kind of doubt it because, I mean, isn't it your experience that if one person noticed something, lots of people do? And so there we have the three refuges, my friend saying to me, you know, you really kind of went unconscious here and caused some harm, and you may want to take a look at this. You know, and, and I ended up making some apologies. Um, and so there is the teaching, there is the sangha, there is this vow to take refuge in what is, even when what is is not so pretty. And um, there is practicing these precepts as an illumination of, of how I might need to grow, how the sangha might need to develop. Um, and so it's very rich. And, um, and as I said, very, very personal. And, uh, and I am closer with this Dharma sister now than I've ever been. Um, even though it was very difficult what we experienced. And, uh, and then we wanted to talk um, a little bit about not intoxicating the mind of self or others. Because that also can seem like a pretty obvious one. You know, don't drink too much, don't take drugs, you know, don't um, impair your thought, you know, affect your actions by um, imbibing in those ways. But um, let me ask you guys, is there anything you can get intoxicated on that doesn't involve ingesting anything? What is it? Well, I think I think, especially, and I think this affects a lot of people, I mean, like, you know, the internet, computers, mm -hmm. you know, your phone, I mean, again, you're, you know, always kind of looking something up, and again, it's kind of, it's kind of tricky, because you think you're doing something good, and yet you're kind of, you get kind of, sometimes you can get kind of obsessed with it, you know, you know and it kind of has a way of taking over, and I, I think of that when mm -hmm. I think of that. Anything that takes over for what is and being able to engage with that as an intoxication. Would you want to say something? I, it, essentially the same thing, but we yeah. also do that with people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can do that, you know, I, I can get intoxicated on thinking how great I am when I take up other people's space by talking too much. Mm -hmm. So I give Dharma talks. It's, I like to think that's a, you know, more um, helpful way of channeling that kind of energy. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, there's a lot of energies or things that uh, we can get intoxicated on. Mm -hmm. And again, the 10 clear mind precepts, I think an indicator is, what's the state of my mind? Is it clear? Is it, is it fuzzy? Am I remembering what's most important to me? You know, like I have friends who will be on the computer so much that they don't eat, they don't go to the bathroom. You know, they don't respond to real people. And so that's not taking care of the life that's in front of us. So again, a very uh, simple um, precept, vowing not to intoxicate, and yet there are so many ways of um, practicing with it, and there are so many um, areas of life that it can illuminate and hold a mirror up to us so that we can really take a look at what's happening and what we're doing. Um, yeah. Well, I, I was going to ask about the news. It's one that I, mm -hmm. I mean, we've talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we talk ourselves into like I want to be informed when I get <laughs> for the selection. I want to understand, and then of course we read the only read the articles that support what mm -hmm. we think. And it just and then after a while it becomes depressing, and mm -hmm. so it's, it's just. I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is. Well, I think I think again, it's pretty personal. I know for me, like I am, I love NPR. <laughs> I, I, fortunately, I have my own business. I'm a consultant, as Jim said. And the day after the election, I um, had a whole day in the office, and I had to make myself turn it off when I had projects I had to actually concentrate on. Um, I I think for me and and my you know working with the people that I work with, you know, it's again about that clear mind, you know, and when I imbibe, whether it's uh, you know, Malbec wine or the news or um, 
Grey's Anatomy, to the point where my mind isn't clear and where um, I start actually being affected in ways that aren't helpful, it's probably time to stop. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a, um, a really uh, very early teaching called the Abhidharma, um, uh, which is very interesting. It's about really studying different feelings and states of mind. And there's a practice where you watch a state of mind arise, um, and you actually feel it as gathering energy before it becomes, you know, negative, positive, neutral, and then thoughts and feelings happen. Mm -hmm. So I think that if we pay attention, you know, I can start to notice, like if I am watching some TV, there's an energy of lethargy that starts to gather, and before it really comes into being, I know it's time to turn off the TV. Because if I don't, I'll be there for a long time. <laughs> So it's a very interesting practice, and it's a physical practice, to notice what's gathering in my body, and then to see it, it sort of gives birth to, you know, negative feeling, positive feeling, neutral, and then that conditions thoughts and feelings. And so when you notice the gathering energy, then that's, you have kind of a choice point as it sort of gives birth to whatever the experience is. Yes. The thing I was thinking that I mean sometimes these and again I'm coming from the Christian tradition too mm -hmm. and of course I was thinking about the Ten Commandments as well. But um, people can also become obsessed with it too. Like again, where you, know, you take what are guidelines and you become kind of you know mm -hmm. you know you spread it to all these other areas and that's all you're thinking about mm -hmm. too. And um, and rather than they become liberating, they become almost something you become almost a slave to. You mean they and, become rules kind of right rigid exactly rules. yeah rid, yeah the rigidity of it there and I think that's the shadow side because I think I know in the Christian tradition I'm sure it's very true for the Buddhists as well as originally these you know these precepts or these commandments were actually considered very enlightened and it was, they were improvements mm -hmm. over the way people had been acting mm -hmm. you know and so they were meant to be something that was that really was liberating and stuff. Mm -hmm. and unfortunately if time goes on, you know, they, they tend to get this negative aura mm -hmm. about them, you know, and because people have, you know, kind of made either misinterpret them or over interpret them, maybe mm -hmm. is the word as well. Yeah. I think I think that is a shadow side or a danger. And um, one of the things that I appreciate about the precepts is that they are very much alive. And um, at different stages of my life, I actually relate to various precepts mm -hmm. in different ways. Like uh, after I ordained, I, I just came up to be a vegetarian for, for however long uh, after I ordained. And then after about a year, my body told me it needed protein. Mm -hmm. And so I started eating meat again. And I'm not a big drinker, but I didn't drink anything for a year. And, um, and I didn't know whether it would be a lifelong thing or just you know, some kind of practice for a time after I ordained. And, uh, and it's very interesting when you get a bunch of Buddhists in the room and talk about vegetarianism. <laughs> you know, because my teacher Darlene Cohen says, I'm not going to separate myself out from most of the rest of the world by being a vegetarian. I'm going to eat meat and take the karmic consequences. And then I have a friend who thinks that's, you know, just doesn't buy that. Mm. And, um, you know, my body seems to eat meat, and so I try to be, you know, eat meat that's been <coughs> kindly treated and be very conscious of what I'm doing when I eat it. And um, so I, I agree with you. Uh, it's kind of like, what, what is my relationship with the precepts, and am I imposing that on others? And um, I think the other thing with the precepts is that... Um, when they become really rigid, I think that that part of compassion of alleviating suffering rather than causing suffering really isn't served. Mm -hmm. And to me, you know, that's kind of the North Star of practicing with the precepts. And in fact, I had a lovely quote, another quote from um, Robert Aiken that I wanted to read. <clears throat> The 16 bodhisattva precepts, too, are archetypes, skillful means for us to use in guiding our engagement with the world. They are not commandments engraved in stone, 
but expressions of inspiration written in something more fluid than water. Relative and absolute are altogether blended. Comments on the precepts by Bodhidharma and Dogen Zenji are studied as koans, but our everyday life is a great multifaceted koan that we resolve at every moment and yet never completely resolve. Because every moment, every situation is different. So if you want to apply the precepts in the same way every time, it just doesn't work. Does everybody know what these various terms are? Okay. I just wonder if everybody knows what the you know koan and bodhidharma is. Okay. Um, isn't that a lovely quote? Mm -hmm. Expressions of inspiration written in something more fluid than water. I think the other thing um, that's really helpful to note about the precepts is that they are not about good and evil. They are not about right or wrong. They are not about morality. They are about choosing to do good rather than harm. In fact, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever heard Vicki Austin talk, but I uh, happened to hear her in a Q&A session and someone said, well, what is evil really, you know? Um, if, if in the absolute realm we're all connected and everything has equal importance and value, is there evil, what is evil? And she said, evil is causing harm. And um, I, I think that that is a great, um, you know, as I said, North Star for the precepts. Rather than codifying them, um, am I causing harm? Am I causing benefit by what I'm thinking, what I'm doing, how I'm moving through my life in the world? Maybe too, if we, but when, especially with that quote from Robert Aiken, the fluidity, I mean, it, it suggests a process. And I think if you look at it as a kind of process of, of getting to these places, then I think the danger of codifying or making them rigid or, or you, you know, you castigate yourself when you don't do something, you know, you yeah. want to do. I think if you show that kind of kindness to it and realize that, you know, if you if you make that vow to be dedicated to, you know, wanting to live it out, then I think I think it has in each peop in each individual's life, I think it has a kind of process of flow. And if and if you you know, you unite yourself with that, I think you reach there, you know, that's probably the right time for you, you know, and, and, and yet then you then you're fully embracing it because I think you fully experienced it within yourself. Yeah, I think um, I think a good sort of indicator is the precepts are very alive. So if you feel an aliveness when you practice with them, when you look at well, you know, are there ways in which I take what isn't given? Do I take people's energy? Do I you know take their chocolate? Um, uh, there's an aliveness there because it's personal and um, and it's relevant. Um, and I wanted to close by saying I, I just find it so interesting, always have, that, um, that three of the ten clear mind precept, precepts have to do with speech. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> not lying, not slandering, not praising self at the expense of others. Of course you can do all those three things with body language and non-verbally, but essentially they're um, right speech precepts. And, um, you know, when, when I when we reflect on where the precepts evolve from and their place in community so that there is this individual practice with the pre precepts and then there is how they affect us in our community, it really makes sense to me that three of them have to do with speech because so much harm is caused by words. Mm -hmm. And um, and then they're kind of nuanced, lying, slandering, not praising self at the expense of others. Um, so I think that as a community, as a sangha, it's really interesting to work together with those particular precepts, in particular. And I've actually worked with work with nonprofit boards, kind of with a version of those precepts, because there's a lack of awareness of how people speak to each other, mm -hmm. and even the intention behind their words. So I think that, um, I think that, uh, as I said, the precepts are animated by compassion and by connectedness and by, um, by, the, by this great potential for harmony within our own selves and with each other. So um, 
I'm going to end on that note, and let's have more questions and discussion.